this to be more about how San Francisco people experience San Francisco, not about the tourist these places. Uh, like one of my favorite uh, content you have is like there's a Mexican restaurant, people are sitting and eating. So there's a lot of this content that is just amazing. When you put the goggles, it's, it's just really very interesting. So Josh will talk about this, but what we call it, we call it the love letter to San Francisco. And this is the design. So we work very closely together. So my team and I designed these pictures. And if you notice, you know, looking at, for example, this one at the beginning, you don't notice it. But then eventually you realize that it's actually a check mark. It's our sort of uh, brand. And what we wanted to do is, I wanted it to have a little bit of red. So from a distance, you see the sort of color, brand color. But as you approach it, and as you look at it, and you look down on it, you realize that it's actually the shape of our brand. And uh, what happened here at the front, you have a video that shows actually a video loop of the content that is specific to this particular um, station. And then the back of it has the, the Google Daydream that you can actually try out. And then what we wanted to do also, just from a design perspective, we wanted all the data and electrical to come from above so that these pictures can move and can be deployed really quickly. Uh, for me, that part of it was the sort of matrix part. It was the sort of like a, the you know, charges and the blood coming into the, the actual devices. Uh, for me, it was the, the horizon color feeding the devices. Um, that took a while to sort of convince at the uh, corporate level that we should have these giant things going through the ceiling. Uh, we also have a neon that says a golden state of mind. So this is really for us a sort of an installation art. People walk around it, experience it. And that's it. I think the point of this for us was to match the innovation level that Candy's and his team were taking to the design and bring that into the content space. Uh, Riot, if you haven't heard of us, we are an award-winning content studio focusing on emerging and immersive tech in addition to linear. So it's a lot of high-end VR, a lot of augmented reality, hologram, volumetric capture, really cool things like that that we wanted to showcase and bring to the table, not just from a narrative and entertainment perspective, but do something for the retail market that we hadn't really done before. And concepting was the best part of this project. Because like I said, we're trying to match the innovation levels, so how do you bring something fresh to San Francisco, a city that's world-renowned, the iconic landmarks, San Francisco, Golden Gate Bridge, everything else has been seen by you know, millions of people. We wanted to do something fresh, whether you were a visitor for the first time, or whether you were a San Franciscan who'd spent their lives there, we wanted you to see something differently, see something in a new, fresh way. And so in order to do that, we wanted to, like you said, do something different. And we didn't want to have a guided tour. We didn't want somebody telling you where to go or how this was going to work. We wanted to utilize the best tenets of the medium itself in virtual reality, which is just simply putting you somewhere and allowing you to be an active participant and experience San Francisco, not just watch it. So in order to do that, we had a crazy production timeline. We were trying to reach, um, you know, obviously the, the opening of the store in July. And we shot 30 locations in four days. We had an incredible crew around the city. And we used some never before seen or utilized technology prior to this. And like I said, we shot at all the iconic locations, but we also talked to a lot of locals and figured out a lot of kind of secret spots around the city that even people that have been there their whole lives might never have experienced or only kind of heard of before and seen in this way. And so we have places like the, you know, the Japanese tea garden, Transamerica building, but not only were we showing you that, it was the perspective of being on top of that. We shot with rovers, we shot with helicopters, we shot with drones. And so you really got unique perspectives of the same old stuff. So this is the top of the Transamerica building. We had a drone actually come out of the rooftop. And so when you're in the headset, looking down over the city and looking out over the water, it's just a, a fresh way to see the same old downtown area. We uh, staged a dragon dance at nighttime in the middle of Chinatown. All kinds of crazy things happen. Fireworks and everything else, the permitting for these things was not easy, but we got that on. And then the fun part for me is the tech. So we actually had a custom rig built. I don't know how many of you guys are tech geeks in here, but 
It was nice. We had a, a 10 camera rig that had never been shot on. So we were doing a lot of R&D in the field, but that actually made it a lot of fun. Like I said, utilized helicopters. We were shooting with uh, fresh lenses, this 250 degree lens that captured all of our aerial shots. And it was only 250 degrees. You only got the bottom half of the image. So we actually did a lot of sky replacement. So all the skies were perfectly crystal clear and beautiful for you guys. But that was a lot of fun to innovate on the tech side and weave that into the brand story. And so, you know, in doing all of this, it's trying to figure out what's next. And for us, we really wanted viewers to leave the store talking about how great the design was, talking about how great the experience was from a retail perspective, but also go out and tell their friends, Verizon is doing something completely different on the content side. And this was incredible. You need to go check it out and just hopefully add to the work now to get more people in the stores and add to the bottom line of the retail side. Great. Now, Bill Spalding, Technology Director, and Mayor Weiss, Principal of Burke Lion, will present. We're going to start, we're going to kick you back into a different perspective as we flip flop between um, presenters. We're going to come at this from the designer point of view. So, how many people in here are, have like drawn perspectives, work with plans, do design work? Um, and the funny part when we get at how we got here, um, by the way, I'm there. <laughs> um, it, it brings me back, and I don't want to date myself too bad, because they're, we think about our children and people being, you know, growing up with technology, but 15 and 20 years ago, we were like smelling markers and trying to do these perspectives and trying to do a design, but saying, you get these three views, because I've already pulled six all-nighters, and this is what you're getting. Um, and so there's just been this giant leap from then to now, and how you can design, um, which we'll get to with virtual reality, and how that changed. So, um, Phil, go ahead with the evolution. Well, there's um, most of you were probably around to figure out Brian Cad was really just drawing by hand, but on the computer. You did save some time, but how do we get and jump into 3D? So, in that early 2000s, we started using SketchUp because it was so easy, but you throw it away. Just build something, build something here, and keep having all these models. So it was fun to get this going. And merchandising was painful, but we got a lot of it together. What was happening though is the hardware wasn't able to keep up. It's like all of a sudden we have these computers that there's no way they could keep up with what we wanted to do. So around 2010, the hardware got better, the computers got faster. It started to make sense what the processing speed we computer processing versus graphics processing. And when that started happening, we could bang. Oh, this is my little boy Josh playing <laughs> Minecraft on our like, $8,000 uh, <laughs> so, But, our tele office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had a test it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> this is what started to change. We can actually bang the gaming industry a lot from where we are right now, like how quick it happened. Around 2016, a lot of software started to catch up. So yes, we uh, jumped on the bin wagon at some point in 2003, 2006, 2007, and we started using Revit full-time in house. So at least we have that process where it's you build the model from the survey or whatever you have, and it's the same model that you're using all the way through. But the rendering was horrible. It was just so bad. So we, we had workarounds. But it was always that, say we had 10 perspectives to present, it was two hours, three hours, four hours in Photoshop for each one. And then if something changes, it's like, oh, I don't know about the So, So we got together, it's like, how does it fit with our process? How does it work? We are so immersed in what we do, but we're not immersed in what we're producing, like how we're working virtually in the computer. So that's what started to change. These are the game changers that game changers. My Boston accent will so SketchUp, Revit, cloud rendering was a cool thing that saved us a lot of time. But Panos, I'm going to show you. So if on your phone, if you have a QR reader, do most of you have a QR reader on there? If you don't, download the app real quick, because the next slide is going to have something you can <laughs> So Panos Oculus Rift, that's the headset that we use. 
laser scans. If you're not familiar with that, that allows you to go ahead and do a laser scan of an existing space, bring that point cloud into your modeling environment, and work from there. So that's something. Enscape has been the biggest game changer, and that's actually a software. It's a plugin for Revit that where it's it's literally press a button and you're in the space. It's crazy. You think that? Is that? Yeah. So we use Revit differently than a lot of places. We're doing our lighting power density calculations in Revit, gathering all that information, really working at the design level to find out what we're doing with a lot of information. Yeah. This is the geeky side of us, yeah. guys. Sorry, we don't want to. There's coolness and then there's yep. geekiness when it comes to. So here's the QR code. Yeah. If anybody wants to snap that, you'll see the inside of our Nick and Zoe prototype. You can see these images right here. I don't know how shiny it is, but this is right here at our store. So this is how we design, how we go into it. Did you look around the store? This is okay. this has become. I mean, QR codes have been around for a while. Panos have been around for four or five years. We've been doing these, but imagine being able to present to your client. You send them, you send them a link. You know, just bring it up on your phone and tell them what you think of the ceiling design. And so this is very flat. This is not. Um, the Oculus Rift, but this has less, uh, you know, there tends to be with Oculus Rift a little bit of nausea for some people, so it's a, a comfort level in being able to walk around the space. Um, but it's that client and designer relationship. Uh, we no longer have to do two perspectives. We now can just send them a link to the space, and they get to just walk around it. So imagine presenting this way. We, we um, you know, I don't want to go into but we, you know, you're able to send this and you know think about the live catalogs and this, but this is only from a point. So what you'll notice when you're looking at this is you're standing still and you can't move. This is not a walkthrough. This is a permanent yeah. place or stuff. So you do like five different points. Yeah. But how we really work, and this is something. So this gets into a little so, bit of dorkiness, and we'll slowly start the <laughs> So this is inside the store. When you walk through, Mir will have the headset on, or Catherine, one of our designers, is walking through. If we're in a space where it's like, well, let's take that, let's take that other display case out, and let's look at it with it out in the store. So, okay, so now it's gone. And as you're working, we can make the changes live. So somebody will have the headset on. And somebody else will be at the computer and like, okay, well, let's move that over. And this is that same Revit model that allows us to go through the whole process without throwing anything away. So there's much, there's like hardly any waste to what we're, what we're rebuilding. There's a little bit of a delay from the Enscape as it starts to refresh itself. Um, but imagine, you know, you're meeting with your client and they're just sitting and walking through the space. If you could, and you know, here we are in a, a world of finishes, and they say, well, that wall looks like. As brick. Okay. Brick. Um, and it's simple to do, but now it's brick in reality. So this is this is render real time and there's no Photoshop involved in this. It's gotten so good that you can present from this without having to send it overseas or spend hours and hours and hours on it. Um, making it look even better. So the Nick and Zoe one was a really good product for us to show through. It was a little sketchy. A lot of the merchandising and everything that we did, playing with the light levels and really seeing it helped a lot walking through. This one really makes me feel good about the direction we're going in because it's, it's a museum store. And when you go through the shop, there was some different design things that we're looking at, like you look in different types of modes walking through. But there's something that changed in the software in the last month or two that allowed you to not focus on stuff here, but look at the focal point on something that you're more interested in. So that's what this is changing. It's again on the geeky side, but that's pretty cool. Because you're getting a real camera type feel to it. But Mary can speak to this part where we actually copied one of the oh there's our design team like working. There's Mayor and Catherine and Eric who was in here earlier throughout some stores. Let's see. Mayor, do you want to talk to this the about the part about us again? Yeah, so we we're able to what's interesting when you put on Oculus Rift it actually understands your height, so where your eye level is. So if you're shorter or taller, it puts you in that place. And so you can experience the store. We were able to shop it, and at some point, in, in the actual, we were able to reach our hands up to the shelves. 
And at in this point, because we had such high ceilings, we were like, wow, we're going to do the shelves this way. And then we got into the store, and I'm like, nobody can shop that shelf. <laughs> and so, you know, this whole thing became you, you try to catch all those glitches in your design um, by just playing with it. So we were able to, you know, real time, just fun, playing around, say, you know what, the shelf's too low, I can't reach it, the shelf's too high, or someone shorter is like, yeah, it could be too high. Um, but you can just take it and adjust it and play with it in a 3D world where you really can't get that in two dimension in elevation. Yeah. And Enscape is the um, plugin that we're using for Rapid. Right. Yeah. There are other ones out there where you can, like Unity, but you need to be able to program a little bit. So this is. Yeah. We're not doing that. Um, so it's just been a fabulous tool, um, and the Enscape, uh, I don't want to give a like, plug for Enscape, I think it's great, but what's really fun about this is we've been able to send, we, um, for an update, we designed their corporate headquarters, and we were able to send them the whole building, we did the building for them and the interiors, and you know they could go home and use their kids' Xbox joysticks and walk through it yeah. on their TV, you know, during dinner, and they came back to us with feedback on the design. So this relationship is changing significantly um, on how you use a model. What What's nice about this case study is for Sonos, we're doing shop and shops, and we have. I wanted this to be like the Matrix where they fly by all the weaponry they're going to grab, and they grab one of those shop and shops. Okay, how does it work in this location? So this is what's happening now, but we think it's the real next. So if you're in a store or in your here, and I know for Vera Bradley, they have a little pop up here, but the shop and shop, if we wanted to see what this particular shop and shop looks like, you can hold up an iPad on site, flip through it. So now this is jumping from virtual reality to augmented reality. So with augmented reality, you actually have, you're in the site space, and now you're putting virtual elements in there to see what it's like. So there are a couple things that are doing that now too. Ikea has an app, if anybody's used it, it's, it's an augmented reality app where you find a piece of furniture, you look at it in your house, it's kind of cool. I was showing it to my kids, like, we should get this and try to find it. But Jeff Coombs, the artist, is, is doing some installations that are also using augmented reality. So it's happening. Pokemon Go. I mean, yeah, Pokemon it's, it's Go. It's definitely okay. happening. But yeah. so this is the interesting connection is that <coughs> architecture firms have been doing this for buildings and, and sites. So, uh, Perkins and Will has just a great um, uh, department where they really uh, get into technology. But being able to look at the site and then hold the iPad and see this new building so on that site before putting it. And so the idea, I think, for pop ups and being able to put a pop up in a store. And see how it's going to fit if that's the right location and spin it around to figure out where the entrances should be in 3D in a virtual world is um, it's I, I, we want to say it's like what next but it's kind of there it just needs a little bit more work or maybe some coding yeah. uh, to work with foreground um, and, and the background well, so we added the what's now and what's next that picture on the upper left is actually not uh, a rendering that's a professional photo of an installation of one of the shopping shops in the Fenway area in Boston. I was talking to the PM about it to get some more background. He said, yeah, we find the location in the store, the truck drives up, in six hours they build that. So when we fabricated it, we built all the pieces, two-inch steel and everything, so they can go ahead and just plop it in, six hours they can build one. What's next? Hardware and software is no longer keeping us back. So now all these companies are building handheld devices and whatever that works. So I would love to see no wires and no headset. I don't know if you've ever put a headset on and you're going to get a chance to do it later, but I don't know, five or 10 minutes in a headset, it might take 15 minutes to get your balance back when you get off of it. So please be careful if you do put a headset on anywhere. And we don't really want to just get in a room with our clients and put the headset on them. It, it might not always work right. We want them to walk yeah. into the room. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, eye tracking. It's something that can happen now, but we want it to happen so when you're in the device, we want to see what they're looking at. That would be cool. And actually combining laser scans with existing virtual reality would be great, because right now they're separate. We would love to be able to put our stuff in. Last thoughts? Virtual build and map the magic. We don't want to build all this stuff. We want to map whatever the merchandise is to it, so we're not spending a lot of time building merchandise. Review and update real time. 
limit post-production work. All those hours of Photoshop, you really touch Photoshop. Right? And immerse yourself. Get in the design. And I think that's the biggest thing. We're designing it because we can get inside of it and really understand it. Yeah. The biggest benefit is you get to see every single inch of the space, every corner. Um, it just changes your world. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Melissa Flickender, Director of Store Planning, Design, and Visual Merchandising at Vera Bradley. Hi everybody, I'm Melissa, and I'm going to um, tell you the Vera Bradley uh, VR story. Um, earlier this year, we partnered with uh, New York Fashion Tech Lab. Um, New York Fashion Tech Lab is a nonprofit organization that started in 2014. They connect um, young female tech startups with fashion industry leaders. Through uh, New York Fashion Tech Lab, we were able to connect with Neha Singh. She is an MIT graduate who also worked for Condé Nast and Google. At that same time, we were getting ready to launch our home production, which presented a lot of challenges for our small stores. We just did not have the capacity to display bedding within those um, those stores. So through Neha and her um, company Obsess, which is a virtual reality uh, company that's bringing uh, VR into retail experiences, and Google, we were able to add VR to 10 locations throughout the country. Um, Google was excited to partner with us because we were one of the first retailers to offer a, VR sh a true VR shopping experience. And we have the uh, headset here, so later after the presentation, if anybody wants to try it out, to see what it's all about there. <laughs> In late July, we launched the, uh, the home collection at our flagship um, space in Soho. The launch was a slumber party complete with milk and cookies. <laughs> Everyone that attended got to try out the headset. We had some great press. Um, Adam Glassman from Oprah was there. There were several um, articles on the web about the party. Um, after the party, we expanded the, the Daydream um, set to 10 locations in places like Chicago and Dallas and Fort Wayne, Indiana. And it was a really great experience for our consumers because they were able to not only see the bedding, kind of in reality, um, which was not there in person, um, but they also got to see our Soho location. The uh, users experienced the four different bedding collections and typically spend about five minutes in the experience. It's great because it expands the capacity of our stores. We typically have 2,500 new SKUs each season with a about 1,500 square foot uh, floor plan we can't necessarily show something like bedding in every location. Um, so with this, our bedding was a complete success. We sold out of many of the SKUs within the first week. Um, we also, last night, received the 2017 BMSD Excellence in Visual Merchandising and Design Award at the Big Gala. So for everybody, for anybody who doesn't want to try the VR, I've also got a little video uh, from Obsess here.
Lauren Shipman, CEO and Principal of Shipman Design Architecture, will wrap up today's presentation. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, so it's been really interesting seeing how different firms, different retailers approach virtual reality. Right now we have 47% of the whole world has the internet. In America, it's of course much greater number, we're at 87%. So my question is, how can we use virtual reality to speak a common language? How do we really take this technology and eliminate those pain points and create a more perfect store, a more perfect restaurant, a more perfect user experience? So I'd like to talk a little bit today um, about, we talked about point cloud laser scans. I also would like to talk about um, how VR can use, be used across different stakeholders within the design construction process and how we can create that more perfect store. <laughs> so point cloud scan. So this basically is like goodbye, take measures, hello lasers. And so what it is is a condensation of points that can actually measure and document existing conditions. So if that doesn't mean anything to you, I just want you to look at this picture here. And so that is what comes out of our point cloud laser scans. We technically use the Faro scanner. But what we can do with it is actually build the environment straight from the site. And what this enables us to do is talk to real estate. We can host it on the cloud and send them the model. We can put it straight into the Oculus or the HTC Vive, either one of those headsets, and they can walk through that point cloud scan in person. It has accuracy up to three millimeters, and it can be imported either into Revit or CAD, depending on the client's workflow. So you can see here, this is actually in a ceiling plenum. We stick the camera up there, and it doesn't matter how much light there is, because it is using laser technology, and we have all of the HVAC systems tracked and <laughs> measured all at one time. So the great thing about this is you have all this technology, you have all this data in your hands, you don't need to keep going back to the site. Maybe your engineers don't need to go out to the site for that first one. It's all about expediting the process. I love technology, you guys. <laughs> if I maybe go over here. Okay, so we talked a little bit about what we can do. We have the ceiling plenum composite. You can see all of the different um, aspects in the plenum are being tracked there. We have very quick floor plans, which we can draw from. We have slope analysis, very difficult to measure in the field, and the point cloud, point cloud can do that for us, as well as a Revit, Revit overlay for um, uh, accuracy. So now, let's move into how we use this throughout the process within design, construction documents, and construction. We're going to be talking mainly about the Manhattan Ulta. Who has been there? Yeah? Do they know you by name? <laughs> so it is on uh, 86 and 3rd. We have Shimenti Construction. Hello, Tom. Was our partners on this one. And um, so I want to talk kind of about how we use virtual reality throughout this entire process. So first, finish options. In a makeup store, there are a lot of reflective surfaces. So it really depends, if you think about what does the floor do in the space, it's not just looking at the color, it really affects how those reflective surfaces are picking it up. So if you see all of the different options that we had in there, and this they experienced within the VR, so these are still renderings that we pulled, but you can see what a difference it really makes in the space. That was my least favorite. So we did go with the lightest floor at the end of the day. And so that's bringing store design in, and that's also making sure that everyone is on the same page. Moving forward, looking at lighting layouts, they had selected these really amazing um, statement lights that have the pops of the brand's colors. So these are very specific lights. How do you create a lighting design within a makeup store that needs to be bright, needs to be cheery, and incorporate the right light levels within these statement lighting pieces. So we had many different options for them to look through. These all had accurate lumen values in there as well to make sure that we're getting the right amount of light import. So this is, we're looking, as I mentioned, we're looking at this um, still rendering, but we were going through this process looking underneath. How does it look when you're in the middle of the store? And then this is a little bit of behind the scenes, how it's all programmed within the device 
and how all of those spec sheets are put into there. So moving forward, salon design and sight lines. So at our typical 10,000 square foot Ulta store, you have your salon in the back, everyone knows this, there's no windows. So what happens when you introduce a flagship design where you have windows along the entire wall? How does that change how you think about that salon experience? What does it look like from the inside and how do we keep things organized, looking neat, looking clean? And then my question is, how does it look from the outside and how can we create an experience that really draws the community in? A lot of people don't even know that Salon has an Ulta. An Ulta, Ulta has a Salon. So this is a huge opportunity for them to continue to grow their brand and really show them as a differentiator from their competitor, which is right around the corner. So looking here, this is a walkthrough that we did. We recorded this and sent this out to the client. Now, um, we talked about QR codes earlier. I'd like everyone to open up their programs to where they see my shining, smiley face. And you'll see a QR code in there. If you do have an iPhone and you're updated to the latest iOS, you don't even need a QR scanner. You simply take out your camera and show it right at the QR code. You don't need to press a button or anything. And so what you're able to do here is, as Mayor and Bill mentioned, is we can send it out to the client via text. We can send it out via email. We can send it out as a password protected link. And it's been an incredible tool for sending that out. So looking here at Sightlines, what is the customer experience when they're walking through the store? How are the brands portrayed? Are we making sure that all of the different brands are getting the Sightlines and the exposure that they need within the store? What is the customer experience as they go into the Q theory? Of course, with makeup, we know that those impulse purchases are very important. So we want to make sure that's easily shoppable. Excellent. So looking at the fragrance area, the queue line, the store entryway, the checkout counter, how are site lanes really working within this store? We also worked with loss prevention. All stores are worried about shrinkage, but especially in a makeup retailer, those lipsticks disappear very quickly. And so we actually had loss prevention come into our office. We flew them up to the ceiling, and then we mimicked what the cameras would see in order to make sure that there were no blind spots in the store. So this is something that previously you would kind of give your best guess. You'd look at it on the floor plan and say, well, you know, we need them every 50 feet, so I think they should be here, here, and here. Especially because of the ceiling design, we wanted to make sure that there were no blind spots and that loss prevention would really be covered. So it's kind of thinking about what can we do to speak that common language between the stakeholders? How can we really bring everyone into the picture throughout the VR process? <laughs> How can we bring everyone throughout the VR process? There we go. Okay, excellent. You need a name to There we go. <laughs> so now we have all of our design approvals. Everything's forward full steam. There's been no backtracking in the design process. There probably was a little bit of backtracking in the design process. So as we are putting together our construction documents, we're sending out still renderings pulled from the simulation to Ulta's graphics department. And so what they're able to do is start putting in their graphics packages. How does this work? How does this feel in this space? Does this make sense? What are holiday promotions going to look like? So it's really making sure that this simulation we talked before, there's no waste. We want to be a zero waste world, right? So also in our workflow, how are we being most efficient? Looking at their exterior package, we put this in and realized, hey, where they wanted to set up their exterior signage was not appropriate with the lighting. So we were able to fix that and adjust that signage placement before everything got uh, built in, in the uh, job site. So talking a little bit about complicated details, we have a ceiling curve, we have video walls, we have lighting that needs to be placed exactly and also hung at very specific angles to make sure we saw those brand colors pop. So what we were able to do was take all the details from the simulation, put them directly in the drawings. When we went into the site and I had our store designer from Ulta went through, 
He did not change one single light in there. You'll see how many there are. We also had, this is actually from the Chicago project. We had all of the GCs walk through on their site and they did the pre-bid walkthrough. Everyone was on the same page so they could really determine what was different in this project from a prototypical Ulta. What is going to be an above and beyond extenuating circumstance? We also um, printed out large scale renderings that were used on site to supplement the CV process. So you can start seeing, we see this ceiling creation. So the ceiling was actually designed to mimic a woman's lip, which I think is a really beautiful thing. And so how do you get that curve just right, taking it exactly from the simulation? So we're filling in the ceiling there. And then we start hanging the lights. And this is where things got a little bit tricky. So you can start to see how this is all affected. Ultimately, these uh, flush light pictures were chosen along with those statement lights to really provide the right amount of light in the space. So you can see kind of from our CDs exactly how complicated that was. And um, one of my favorite things is I was talking to um, the architect in charge of the project and preparing for this. And she said, you know, the most disappointing thing is you know exactly what it's going to look like. And there are no surprises. And the grand opening happens and you're like, yes, it looks exactly like it looks. But she said, also, the great thing about this is that there are no surprises. Right? And so it's all about that common language. How can we get the rendering and the reality to really sing together? Of course, the scaffolding. We would Photoshop that out. Right? <laughs> And the same thing here, looking at this graphics and how it worked with the hair dryers. You will notice that in our simulation, Ulta had requested that the entire store was merchandised because we were working with um, merchandising, we were working with operations. So it was a lot of modeling to do. So kind of my, my last question I would like to leave you with is, as we continue to develop VR, as it becomes more ubiquitous, in today's society, it becomes cheaper, it becomes faster. What are those pain points? You mentioned no one likes putting on a headset, right, at the end of the day. So what can we do to continue developing the technology in a way that's seamless, that is appropriate for the situation, and that really, um, I would say, elevates the experience. It's not sitting in the corner in a way that doesn't really make sense. It's integrated with the space, it's integrated with the community, so I would um, encourage all of you, whether you're retailers, designers, fabricators, to think about how we can continue to build this community and develop this common language. It's an experience economy, so you really have to make sure that you're delivering the customer's expectations. And um, I think it's exciting, and, it, and the evolution of it is you know, really going to be interesting. But I think we all really got a lot of insight into how it's being used in the design community from both perspectives, from the in-store experience and really how that elevates, you know, a customer's uh, journey and the brand's uh, narrative, and also, you know, how fascinating it is from the design processes and what you can really uh, troubleshoot uh, in the cloud. So, um, really want to thank everybody for uh, joining us, and once again, there's my outstanding, unbelievable panel.